back to AOPA's Pilot Information Center live stream webinar series. Our topic for this episode is ADSB. I'm Ferdy Mack and thanks for joining us. This webinar is brought to you by AOPA's Pilot Information Center. As part of your AOPA membership, you can contact us with any aviation related questions as well as medical and digital product support at 800-872-2672, that's 800-USA-AOPA, Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Or you can email us in the Pilot Information Center at pilotassist at AOPA.org. Before we get started, I'd like to remind our viewers that you can subscribe to this AOPA YouTube channel by using the red subscribe button. Also, please send us your questions during this live presentation through the chat box just next to the video. We will answer the most popular questions at the end of this hour-long presentation. Also, if you are not watching this live, the chat box is disabled, so please feel free to contact us with your questions in the Pilot Information Center at 800-872-2672. Joining us today are Mike Collins and Rune Duke. Mike is AOPA's Technical Editor and Director of Business Operations in our Media Division, and Mike has investigated and reported on various available ADSB hardware choices, as well as the installation experience. Thanks for being here, Mike. Good to be here for you. Excellent. And Rune is our Senior Director of Airspace and Air Traffic in our Government Affairs Division, which means that he spends his time working directly with the FAA and other groups on a variety of topics important to general aviation, including ADSB. Welcome, Rune. Happy to be here. Glad to have you both. Thanks for taking the time. So gentlemen, let's get started. Can you give us an overview, Mike, of uh, what we're going to cover in this episode? So what we'll start with tonight is uh, dispelling some myths about ADSB. There's a lot of misconceptions out there and we'll uh, clarify some of those, make sure everybody has the current information. Uh, we'll talk about some equipage strategies for those aircraft owners who are required to equip with ADSB out in time for the January 2nd, 2020 mandate. Uh, and then uh, we'll also talk about uh, free money, the FAA rebate is back. So uh, we'll start right into the slide deck. Uh, what is ADSB anyway? I never like to do a presentation and assume that everybody knows everything. So uh, ADSB is the uh, key enabling technology for the FAA's next generation air transportation system. Uh, basically, your aircraft, equipped aircraft, will take their GPS position, uh, transmit it once per second to other aircraft and to FAA ground stations. Um, the ground stations will rebroadcast data to aircraft on the other ADSB frequency. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and uh, the traffic can be displayed on equipment in aircraft equipped to receive that data. And then uh, last but not least, the FAA is using that data today to separate air traffic. Ah, so we're going to get into that in a moment, actually. Are they actually using the data prior to the 2020? Exactly right. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. So uh, let's get a li into a uh, little more detail. Let's talk about uh, what's going on today. Well, we've, we've come a long way. It was actually uh, eight and a half years ago the final rule was put in place. So it's been a little while, and we still have a little ways to go, but it's getting very close. Uh, so way back in May 2010, uh, the final rule was published, um, and that same rule stands today unchanged. Um, there's two components of the rule. The first is 91225. That tells you where you must have ADSB. And then there's 91227, which tells you exactly how your ADSB out system must perform. So those are the two components of the ADSB rule, where you must have it and how your system must perform. Um, and one of the top questions I get is, how many aircraft are actually affected by, by this rule? How many aircraft need to uh, equip? Um, and so MITRE, the FAA, AOPA, and Embry-Riddle have all done a lot of analysis, a lot of research on this topic, and it's about 140,000 general aviation aircraft will be affected on January 2nd, 2020. These are aircraft that routinely fly into rural airspace, so are affected by that 91225 rule. Today, um, we have about 50,000 general aviation aircraft equipped. So we have a ways to go, and that's uh, where we're at today, is trying to assist aircraft operators, understand the requirements, and uh, some of the available incentives to equip, including the rebate. Excellent. So uh, let's, uh, let's give everyone a little sneak preview of that, that rebate information. And then a little later in the program, we'll, uh, we'll get into the, the nitty gritty as far as uh, if it applies to you. Well, we, we got some very good news uh, recently. Back in September, the FAA announced they were, excuse me, in October, announced they were restarting the ADSB rebate. 
Um, AOPA lobbied very hard, um, and that is because the FAA allocated $10 million for general aviation for ADSB equipage, and they only used about $5 million in the first round. So we lobbied very hard. This money was already allocated for general aviation. We said, FAA, let's make it available. Let's use it. And they agreed, and they restarted it October 12th. Um, it runs for one year. Um, we thought we'd start with eligibility, since this is usually the, the, the good place to start. And for $500, um, they will pay you to equip. They will, they will cover, uh, give you a rebate of $500, but you must be eligible. So here's the eligibility. Uh, the first is it must be a U.S. registered fixed-wing single-engine piston aircraft whose operations requires an onboard pilot, of course, and it has to be registered before January 1st of 2016. So new production aircraft are not qualifying. Those aircraft, um, by and large, are already coming ADSB equipped anyways. Um, the focus of the rebate um, back in 2016, as it is today, is largely for the most cost-sensitive operators. And the FAA researched this. We provided a lot of data to them, and they decided it was the single-engine piston aircraft. Um, and what they want to do is, number one, uh, make sure everyone was aware of the rule, and a rebate is a really good way to increase awareness. And number two, incentivize equipage, so people are equipping much earlier than they otherwise would. Um, and that is because we're now getting to the point where uh, installation shops are having scheduling issues. Um, and Mike's going to talk a little bit more about that is, um, some operators are doing more than just ADSB uh, installations when they, when they actually go into the shop. So it's taking a little bit more time, and that's uh, the other aspect is highlighting those shop constraints. Uh, but we have about a year. Um, we have a, right now 1,400 pilots with reservations, and already 180 pilots have flown and actually completed the process. So we're already making good progress. Excellent. So I have a question for each of you. Uh, Rune, one of the questions we often get in the Pilot Information Center regarding applicability of the, either the prior, uh, the first incarnation of the rebate or the current one is, what if I own three airplanes? And or, what if my club owns more than one aircraft? How, how, how does what the applicability work in those situations? Sure, and yes, exactly right. And so the eligibility is one rebate per registered, uh, per, per entity, mm -hmm. we'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. So if you, as an individual, um, own multiple aircraft, you are only eligible for one rebate. So think of it as one aircraft. If your flying club or your flight school owns a whole bunch of aircraft, you, you only get one. Um, and that is because the FAA wanted to impact as many operators as they could. And because this is to uh, incentivize those who are most cost sensitive, those with a larger fleet may be more capable of uh, equipping that fleet than otherwise an operator with maybe just one aircraft. So it was the FAA's philosophy, and uh, they make the rules. Fair enough. So then, Mike, uh, so even if I'm eligible for the rebate, it's a sizable amount of money for me to have to, si to save up. You know, maybe I don't think I'm gonna, my club is going to have the money to equip by 2020. Let's start, let's start talking about some of the myths. Is this thing going to happen? Or well, am that's, I gonna, am uh, that's I going to be able to push back. That's the uh, that's the main question that I'm asked. Is the the, the deadline's going to slip? Right? What do you think, Rune? Well, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> we've we've had eight and a half years, and the FAA has been um, uh, very sure. Have been publicly out there uh, explaining that no, the the mandate stands. Um, we read articles pretty much every month now about the military slipping equipage or, or their deadline. Um, the FAA and the military signed a memorandum of agreement um, a couple months ago specifically to deal with aircraft not ADSB equipped. They have their security reasons, but there will be efficiency issues for the military because they are not so equipped. Um, much of their fleet will be equipped. Um, same with the airlines. The airlines, they're getting pressed because of a so-called exemption. Well, the exemption is from uh, a GPS requirement, not from an ADSB installation requirement. Um, we know from the airlines, they have been very transparent and shared equipage data and their uh, uh, calendar of how they want to equip their fleet. And by 2020, they're anticipating over 95% of the airline fleet will be equipped. Um, so we're anticipating fully and completely the mandate stands, this rebate being part two. Please take it as only an indication the FAA is that serious about it. And we continue to see that from the FAA leadership reiterating again and again, the mandate stands. And uh, another thing I always add, um, you know, the ground station network has been fully operational since, what, 1994? 
uh, if the ground stations were still being built, if they were not already up and running, then I'd say, yeah, the mandate's going to have to slip. But they've been, uh, the, the ground station network was actually completed pretty much on schedule and on or even under budget, which is unusual. Uh, but it also means that, uh, the, as Rune said, the FAA is serious about the, the mandate and the deadline. So uh, a couple other things to keep in mind. Uh, uh, FAR 91-225 is an airspace-based rule, so you only have to equip if you fly in the designated airspace. Uh, so that airspace is uh, Class A, B, and C airspace. Uh, within or above the mode C veil around a class B primary airport, uh, above the ceiling and within the lateral boundaries of class C airspace, uh, class E airspace at and above 10,000 feet MSL over the continental United States, excluding airspace at or below 2,500 feet AGL. Uh, and then, and that's basically, that's, that's the airspace where you need to have a transponder today. So that's all the same. Um, class, the only difference, uh, ADSB is also required in the Class E airspace over the Gulf of Mexico uh, at and above 3,000 feet MSL uh, within 12 nautical miles of the U.S. Gulf Coast. Uh, that's because of the, uh, the extensive helicopter operations out there supporting the oil uh, uh, drilling platforms. Uh, the ADSB has been operational there for a number of years, and it's basically giving them uh, IFR capabilities in an area where they um, were using a grid system that was very inefficient before, when the weather was uh, was below VFR minimums. So, right, right, and and so you know we hear this quite often, and it's a myth. Not everyone needs to equip. Understanding where the rural airspace is, as you just explained, is important to understanding if you're even affected by the rule. There are some states that don't even have ADSB rule airspace, except above 10,000 feet MSL. Um, there's plenty of operators who, who do not see a need to fly above 10,000 feet in those states. Um, but there's other areas, right? And um, for the ADSB out rule, um, it very closely mirrors the Mode C rule. But we know Mode C equipage is required to cross the ADAS, cross border operations. Mode C um, might be required to fly into TFRs. There's other requirements. Those are not yet addressed. Right now, um, you do not need ADSB out equipage to fly across the border unless the other country requires it. You do not need it to fly through a TFR. Um, but we are seeing other countries with ADSB mandates. And uh, Mexico specifically closely mirrors the US's mandate, except to fly in Mexico, you will need 10 1090. And 1090 is required for Class A airspace. Um, because in the United States, we have two options. And we'll go over those two equipment options. But if you fly overseas internationally, you need to be aware of that, specifically Canada. Canada will also probably be a 1090 only uh, ADSB rule. And so if you have AA UAT, you may not be allowed to fly into certain areas of Canada. Uh, but that's a couple years away and it's not yet concrete. Before we get into the 978-1090 discussion, I did want to go back to slide seven just for a moment. We talked about uh, the airspace delineation as far as if and when you may be required to have ADSB specifically with respect to uh, rural airspace. But slide seven also has some other information. Uh, I wanted to bring up uh, the, the electrical system issue as well. That's right. And so, <coughs> you know, if you have a Piper Cub, if you have a glider, if you have a balloon, these are aircraft that are exempt from the Mode C rule in many cases. And it's the same here. Aircraft lacking an electrical system, not subsequently certified with an electrical system, have that same exemption from the ADSB rule. And um, uh, you must equip only if you fly in this rural airspace. Right. So ultimately, I'd like people to walk away with a, as opposed to some <laughs> freaking out, some some level of comfort that you know, we're, we're really overlaying the same thing that people had to come to grips with when transponders became a reality, what 40 years ago. It, exactly. Yeah. The mode C rule was put into place in the early 90s, and at the same time, we have the same equipage trend today. Right. It was um, slowly before the mandate took place. And then after that, years and years would pass, aircraft would change ownership, and now we're, we're very high percentage Motsi equipage. Right. Okay, so uh, we, we shifted gears there a moment ago. We, instead of just talking about ADSB, we started talking about 1090, 978. Uh, we didn't necessarily say it, but we'll also start using words like extended squitter and UAT. Why don't we, uh, why don't we get into that area? Uh, we can certainly do that. So. Um, 
So uh, just to summarize, there are two data link frequencies that you can use here in the United States. Uh, there's the 1090 extended squitter. That's a, a 1090 megahertz mode S transponder. Uh, the other option is a 978 megahertz universal access transceiver, or a UAT. Uh, these are different frequencies. The, um, the 1090 unit is going to be a transponder replacement. That 1090 ADSB will be built into a transponder. The 978 UAT is going to be a remote box uh, on a separate <coughs> frequency. Um, the, um, uh, as Rune mentioned, the 1090 is required for, it's the international standard. If you're going to fly anywhere outside of the United States, go ahead and make that equipment decision now so you don't have to find yourself re-equipping a couple of years down the road. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 1090 is required for flight above flight level 180. Uh, uh, 978 was conceived as an alternative here in the United States because of the number of aircraft. Uh, but the great thing for uh, us in general aviation is the 978 frequency is what gives us the ADSB in the weather and traffic that a lot of pilots are enjoying in the cockpit now, maybe just on a tablet display. Uh, whether you're even if you're even if you're not ADSB out equipped, you can get the weather and you can get some of the traffic information. So uh, that's that's really the biggest incentive for those of us in general aviation. Um, um, and that kind of brings us into the, um, the next myth that ADSB in is required, right, Rune? And, and that, of course, is a myth. It, it is uh, only ADSB out that is required. Um, ADSB in is completely voluntary, but we've seen a wide amount of pilots, large number of pilots, um, uh, purchase a system and have this capability without even installing ADSB out. A lot of pilots are getting ADSB traffic and FISB information today. Uh, but you get the full benefits when you equip with ADSB out as well. Um, but of course, ADSB in is voluntary. You can get NOTAMs. You can get all kinds of great stuff um, if you equip with ADSB in. It's free. It is a, a subscription service that is completely free. Now uh, we're going to move on to other areas, but uh, I want to make sure our listeners and our viewers know: don't worry about 978 versus 1090 as far as what's appropriate for you just yet. We're, we're trying to explain the differences and, and the implications, but later on in the program we're going to be uh, going through some uh, case studies. And it's what we've found is the best way to, to try to step you through the thought process as far as what other people have done, what might be useful for you. So don't worry, we're going to talk in, in detail right. about given what a particular aircraft might have at the moment, what might be the best route, and also a decision process that you might uh, go through uh, along with your, uh, your radio shop, your avionics shop, as far as trying to determine the best solution for you. So we're not going to leave you behind, don't worry. All right, uh, so we talked uh, a little bit about uh, they're using it, and what I was really referring to is, mm -hmm. you know, n it's not just that we're equipping aircraft with ADSB that transmits position information once a second, it's that there's someone on the other end receiving that. But we've talked in the Pilot Information Center with pilots who incidentally have ADSB out and will contact ATC and say, hey, uh, are you seeing my ADSB? Does it look good? Mm -hmm. And there are two things there, but the primary thing is sometimes they'll get a response that indicates to them that maybe their information isn't being used. So what's that next myth we want to get to? Uh, well, air traffic control <laughs> doesn't use ADSB information, does it? Well, they, they Ro do. Rune is a former air traffic controller, so he's qualified to answer this question. <laughs> sure, <laughs> and, and yeah, so, so uh, the FAA, um, as Mike explained, has invested a lot of money and a lot of time <coughs> to uh, put out the ground stations well ahead of time, by 2014. Um, they have now equipped all of the uh, centers um, with automation that ingests ADSB, all of the large tracons, and they're well up to, uh, well into the hundreds of number of smaller tracons that are equipped out of the 155 in the country. So by 2019, all of these air traffic facilities will have automation capabilities um, to ingest ADSB track information from aircraft. This greatly increases the uh, surveillance capabilities of air traffic control. They're able to see lower altitudes, um, more geographic areas. So bringing those benefits already today before the mandate. Um, so this is, this is certainly a myth. Definitely. So a uh, related question. Uh, we mentioned that uh, uh, our, uh, air traffic control centers and TRACONs are bringing ADSB into their automation. Uh, but is that replacing 
the mode C system. So Keith asks us, or excuse me, uh, DNC Travels asks us, if you equip with 1090 extended squitter, AKA a mode S transponder, does that meet the airspace requirement for mode C, i.e. can you get rid of your mode C transponder? So no, no, you still have the equipage requirement for both mode C and uh, ADSB out. Um, and that is because uh, it maybe over time we'll be able to get rid of radar. But right now it is definitely necessary. GPS outages, other, other situations where um, they would want that backup capability. Mm -hmm. And so we do not anticipate that going away anytime soon. Well, but, but let me just add one clarification though, because the mode S transponder has the same functionality as mode C. So if you replace your existing mode C transponder with a mode S ADSB transponder, um, then you are okay. You're getting rid of your mode C transponder, but you still have that transponder capability. Uh, and that's the key thing, because as Rune said, uh, it's, it's possible that somewhere way down the line, we may be able to do away with transponders, but that's not foreseen really by anyone yet. Uh, so you do need to keep a transponder, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about strategies around transponders when we get to the case studies. You know, and, and that kind of also comes up, uh, we get the question about ELTs, and will I need to have an ELT yep. after I equip with ADSB? Um, and we asked that question um, during the rulemaking process, and the FAA was very clear in their response that, yes, you must still have an ELT, and that's because an ELT broadcasts after, after impact, um, or should, um, while an ADSB will cease broadcasting. Um, it's something that we've continued to look at with the FA, and I know they're actually looking at it up uh, in Canada to see if this is a, you know, a valid uh, replacement for ELTs. Okay, so we hit the myth of ATC doesn't use ADSB. Uh, let's go to the next slide and we'll take a look at what that looks like. Sure, and so for air traffic controllers, um, they're seeing on their scope today ADSB traffic in most facilities. Um, it is still up to uh, the controller's discretion whether they have it enabled. As we get greater equipage, we'll see more aircraft or uh, more air traffic controllers using it. Um, but it is the primary surveillance source for air traffic controllers today. Um, so they are uh, uh, being. Um, you know, encouraged to use the system. Um, when a pilot asks, uh, can you see me on your system and the radius be equipped, uh, the controller may not be fully aware of what you're asking or be able to answer you, uh, but that's not their job, right? They're there to separate aircraft and, and help get you to where you're going. There's other ways to see if your system's working correctly. So you don't need to ask air traffic control, um, is my system working correctly? There's other ways to handle that, and we'll go over that. Um, but yeah, certainly ATC, um, we've, we've heard some good news stories of actually air traffic control p calling pilots up, uh -huh. um, ADSB equipped and trying to help them out. Exactly, I've heard a couple anecdotal stories from pilots who are flying along, uh, climbing to their cruise altitude, just VFR flight on a generally nice day, um, and uh, we're getting ready to call for VFR traffic advisories and uh, hear the controller call, their out, air, call out their end number. And they're like, well, I didn't hear that really, did I? Uh, but uh, 20 seconds later, the controller called him again. They answered. The controller saw the ADSB target and wanted to offer VFR radar advisories, and I thought that was great. Yeah, yeah, and, and we're seeing that more <laughs> often. Um, uh, again, you're getting that efficiency if you're flying IFR. Um, you might be able to uh, go in there with vectors when previously you might have had to do something because it was non radar airspace. Exactly. So when, once the pilot gets over the spook factor, uh, right. <laughs> it's a pretty good, pretty good offering. Yes. <clears throat> so I promised earlier in the program that we would uh, cover some of the details on uh, rebate applicability and the process of applying for and receiving the rebate. But before we do that, uh, we did take a question online from Keith, who asks, what are the penalties for flying in rural airspace while not ADSB equipped? Out, that is. Well, as far as penalties, um, I because it is a regulation, mm -hmm. Um, the penalty would be the FAA could take enforcement action. Um, you, you need to comply with the rules as, as responsible aviators. Uh, we want to comply with them. Um, but the FAA has what's called the compliance philosophy, and if it's out of ignorance or misunderstanding, the FAA will work with you and educate you. Um, but if it's out of uh, uh, recklessness um, or choosing not to comply, they have other ways of dealing with that. And um, certainly to work with the operators is their goal, and they just want to make sure everyone is aware and operating safely. Because what it comes down to is, is like everything is, this is a safety issue. They're gonna use this for separation um, and, and they wanna make sure everyone is um, using good, good systems, good installations and equipping of the proper equipage. So um, not only other aircraft near you can see them, 
but also air traffic control can see you. It's it's a safety thing. Always always a good bottom line. Well, it's also important to remember that the ADSB out is not required until January 2nd of 2020. So today, you don't have to have it in come January of 2020, you will. Uh, the other important thing, very similar to the transponder rule, if you ha are equipped with ADSB out, the rules state that you should have it on, you will have it on at all times, uh, just like the mode C altitude. So uh, once you get it and you equip, keep the system on. Right, makes sense. All right, I promised everyone we would finally get to uh, this important part of the show. Show me the money, how do I get the rebate? <laughs> <laughs> well, the rebate is back, mm -hmm. uh, $5 million allocated. So about 10,000 aircraft um, are, uh, are uh, able to participate, 10,000 aircraft owners. Um, it again is open from October 12th through October 11th or until all rebates are expended. Uh, but it really it's a five-step process. I might offer there's a step before that and that is, well, do you even need to equip? And uh, a lot of you, if you're listening to us, you probably do. You're probably flying into large metro areas. Uh, so then, if you want to take advantage of the rebate, it's a five-step process. Step one is really do your homework. Uh, look at your aircraft, uh, listen to Mike and some of his case studies, and figure out maybe what system works best for you, and then talk to your shop. Talk to them and try to get that date scheduled, um, as well as checking your FAA registry data. This is the place where they're going to send the check so you want to make sure your, your FAA registry data is all correct. And that leads into step two, um, because now you're going to actually schedule of your shop the date, and you're going to now reserve your rebate. Um, and what we encourage pilots to do as you go through the rebate process is, although your installation date may only be 30 days away, go ahead and reserve your rebate and give yourself the full 90 days allotted. And that way, if um, you're in the shop, and somehow there's a backlog, you got that wiggle room and you don't have to go in and try to uh, get another rebate or anything like that. We don't want you to expire. So take advantage of that 90 day timeline they provide. Uh, the third step is really easy. You just install the equipment. The FAA doesn't need uh, a receipt or anything like that because step four is where they get the evidence that you did in fact um, equip your aircraft. And that's when uh, within 60 days of that installation, you go and fly in a rural airspace and you validate the performance. And so the FAA is not going to give you the check for the money until your system's actually working correctly. They want to make sure it's good. Um, and then that's step five. So once your system's working correctly, they give you the incentive code, combine that with the reservation code, and they'll send you the check. So, um, Mike, maybe you could talk a little bit about the test since uh, I know you've written about that quite a bit. <laughs> I've uh, written about it. I've done a few of the uh, rebate validation test flights and I've answered a lot of questions about it. Um, so the, the rules to qualify for the rebate, uh, the FAA wants you to fly for 30 minutes in the 91-225 rule airspace, the airspace we just talked about earlier. Um, it's real easy to do within a mode C veil if you're not in a uh, near a terminal area, then you'll want to climb up above 10,000 feet to do that. Um, 30 minutes of flying, uh, some gentle maneuvers and turns, uh, keep, it, uh, keep it real simple. I had an email from somebody just the other day. He went out and did his flight. He was not near a terminal airspace, so he climbed up above 10,000 feet. And to kill time while he was flying around above 10,000 feet, he was doing turns about a point and steep turns and other maneuvers. Um, what can happen is you, you get into that steep turn, uh, even just an intermittent blanking of either the transponder or the GPS antenna will cause a little glitch in the ADSB data collection. Um, you know, if it's just a transient thing, it's not a big deal, but if it happens during the rebate performance validation test flight, it could cause you to be flagged and have to repeat the flight. So uh, uh, it's definitely something to keep in mind. No steep turns, definitely no aerobatics. There have been aerobatic pilots who have done aerobatics and uh, it's legal to do, but know that your ADSB will not be accurate during aerobatic maneuvers. So, um, so those are the key things to remember. Um, 30 minutes in the rural airspace, some gentle turns, some climbs and descents are all the maneuvering you need to do. Uh, just nothing, nothing extreme because you want to get through that without, um, without undue drama or having to go out <laughs> and redo the test flight. Right, and I, you know, uh, I, I know all three of us have worked with a lot of pilots who've gone through the rebate um, or have had issues with the rebate and specifically that um, flight. And so if there's any questions 
um, please ask ahead of time because we would be happy to help you through that. We want you to get the full amount of money and not have to do a repeat flight. The FAA doesn't want it want to make you do a repeat flight. Um, so they have uh, an email address. If you have any questions, um, use that. Um, but again, air traffic controllers, they probably don't even know what the rebate is. That's not their job, and they probably won't be able to help you with that. Um, if you just say you need to fly around in certain areas, just use plain language, but they don't know what a rebate flight is. Um, there's a little more awareness now. Um, there's even been some letters to airmen to help pilots uh, do it in a good area of certain Class B airspace. But by and large, if you have questions, uh, we're here as a resource. Yeah, Houston was very proactive about that. Uh, a controller didn't really understand the rebate, reached out to us, asked about, you know, what is this? Where does the pilot need to go for this validation flight? Uh, and we helped them come up with some areas in the, the two different sides of their terminal airspace, places where a pilot could fly in the rural airspace without being in the way of arrivals and departures. They published a letter to airmen, and uh, so if you're in the Houston area, go find that. Uh, one other suggestion, this is actually one of Rune's, but uh, if you do a rebate flight and you do not pass the, um, the, the test, if you get a red flag and there, it indicates a problem, um, uh, contact that FAA rebate assistance email address before you fly again. First, ask them to manually review your flight because if there's a recording glitch, there's a few things that if they can, can tell what caused it in the report data, they might pass you. It's happened before. Right. Um, and if they can't, then let them tell you why you failed so that either you, maybe you need to adjust your equipment, in which case you want to get that done before you fly again, or if there was a maneuvering issue, uh, you want to, to, know, to, to not do that when you fly again. All right, so five years ago, uh, th when there was a, a much more relative lack of ADSB options available to pilots, combined with five years ago, 2020 being seven years away, uh, there wasn't nearly as much pressure, uh, is my sense at least, uh, for pilots to really pay a lot of attention to ADSB out. So as a result, many pilots focused on the less expensive, more obvious ADSB standalone ADSB in solutions back then. Uh, something battery powered they could put on their glare shield coupled with their favorite tablet and app. Uh, they could get the benefit of ADSB in traffic and weather without having to worry about the mandate, the 2020, the ADSB out or any of the more comprehensive solutions that are now available. So those pilots uh, five years ago thought ADS-B kind of just looks like a black box or a white box on the dash and coupled with my iPad or Android tablet. Now n might be less clear as far as what does the, the actual solution look like. So let's take a look at, uh, at what some of the, uh, the comprehensive uh, in and out solutions look like installed. Sure, and, and the great thing, if you've got an ADSB out solution, I'm uh, sorry, an ADSB in solution that you're using now, you can continue using that. You can equip with ADSB out only uh, to meet the mandate, and uh, you don't have to spend any more money. Uh, so this photo here shows a free flight UAT. It's the blue box on the right side mounted uh, behind the baggage compartment of a Cessna 172. So that is a remote um, uh, universal access transceiver. The little gold box next to it is a Wi-Fi module that sends the ADSB data wirelessly to your tablet right up there in the pilot seat. Um, so. Uh, and, and, and one of the things to keep in mind, these, most of these UATs being remote mount boxes, um, the installation is actually uh, likely to cost you more than replacing your transponder with a Mode S transponder. So when you do get into the selection process, um, make sure you're talking with your shops about installed prices. Uh, the UAT box might cost a little bit less, but by the time you pay for the installation, you may find that a 1090 solution uh, could be the same price or maybe even a little bit less. So uh, the next slide shows a Garmin GDL82. It's a uh, also remote mount uh, unit. It's a, uh, a UAT and this is mounted in the back of a, a Cessna 152. Uh, next, we have uh, probably the two most common, uh, most popular ADSB out solutions. Uh, the unit on the top is the Aperio Stratus ESG. Uh, the unit on the bottom is a Garmin GTX 335. These are both Mode S transponders, so they would replace your existing Mode C transponder. The ADSB out is built in, 
And uh, in fact, they also have built-in uh, GPS receivers that meet the ADSB position requirements. Uh, so you do not have to upgrade or install a, a, a really expensive WAS navigator to provide the position source. Uh, you could install one of these units uh, plus a GPS antenna and connect it and uh, be compliant with the ADSB out mandate. Uh, the 335 Garmin there at the bottom actually uh, also looks, the, the Garmin 345 looks exactly the same. Uh, it's a little more expensive, uh, but it includes ADSB in and out, as well as a Bluetooth uh, module to a Bluetooth uh, transmitter to co transmit that data to your tablet. Uh, the two out only solutions, the Aperio and the Garmin 335, just if you're wondering what the pricing is, uh, the list price on each of those is $29.95, so that plus installation. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a bit of money, but when ADSB first came out, they were estimating that equipage would cost at least five to ten thousand dollars per aircraft. So um, Rune and his friends in DC have done a lot of lobbying, uh, and some of the manufacturers have done done some innovating that have really brought the costs uh, down to a more manageable level. It's not free, but you know it's a lot better than it was. Uh, we do have a couple other products I just wanted to call out. Uh, on the top left here, that's a Lynx NGT 9000 from L3. It's a 1090 extended squitter transponder with a touchscreen color display. So if you're interested, if you don't have a, a multifunction display or uh, you know one of the Garmin uh, navigators with the big color screens and you want to have uh, ADSB in data traffic and weather, uh, displayed in your panel, it's actually a great solution. It's more expensive than the other transponders, but it gives you a lot of bang for the buck. It also has a, um, uh, a, blue, a wireless uh, Wi-Fi uh, transmitter to transmit to your um, uh, iPad or your other tablet. The uh, other nice thing about this, as well as the Garmin 345, the in-out Garmin, they both tie into your audio panel and you'll get RL traffic alerts. So you don't have to be flying around looking at your tablet. Uh, if there's traffic at two o'clock and three miles, you'll hear it right in your ear cups. So uh, that's a nice thing. Then the lower right is a, uh, a transponder from Trig in England. It's a 1090 ex extended squitter transponder, uh, and it has a much smaller um, uh, faceplate. So it gives flexibility to owners who have uh, small uh, panels, don't have much panel space. Uh, actually very popular with a lot of the warbirds. And then this last equipment slide is uh, something that uh, has been the subject of a lot of questions lately. Uh, this is a wingtip mounted uh, universal access transceiver from UAvionics. Uh, it's a new product. Uh, it's about $1,800, just under $1,800. Um, but th their, uh, their promise is a very, a very streamlined installation process. Uh, they estimate that your installation for this should take no more than one hour. So it, it goes on your wingtip. It replaces the nav light. So that little uh, unit there has a, a, a UAT transceiver, has a GPS position source, a um, uh, position light, a, an LED strobe light, and also its own uh, encoding altimeter. So it's got a lot of things crammed into that little box. Uh, they received their TSO about, uh, about a month ago. And uh, the last I heard early this week is that they've completed their flight tests for an expanded AML STC and they hope to have uh, approval as soon as sometime this week. So uh, once that STC is issued, uh, people can start installing them on certified airplanes. They are available today for experimentals and light sports. Excellent. So uh, you talked a little bit about uh, ADSB transmitters, uh, position sources. Uh, let, let's, uh, let's enumerate all the uh, discrete uh, components that uh, comprise an ADSB out solution. Sure, and uh, there's there's three three parts of an ADSB out solution. Uh, uh, t two for sure. One is optional. One is the GPS position source. Uh, you need to have a GPS position source that meets ADSB requirements. Um, uh, it technically does not have to be a quote unquote WAS GPS, but but it has to meet a TSO um, uh, requirement and the uh, existing navigators that do are your certified WAS navigators, uh, the, uh, the Garmin, 
uh, 650, 750, the Garmin 430 WAS, 530 WAS, uh, products like that. Uh, Avidyne also has a couple of navigators that do meet that position requirement. Um, but unfortunately, those are pretty much the only navigators that do. Anything else, uh, you'll need to look at either upgrading your navigation or you can always go with one of those solutions that has the position source built in uh, and, and not spend the money on the um, on the uh, navigation upgrade. Uh, we'll touch on that in a minute. Uh, then you do have the ADSB data link. You've either got the 1090 or the 978 data link. And then uh, if you do want to display the ADSB in data, you need to think about your display solution. If you want to display it on a certified uh, screen, a, a navigation to screen, a navigator screen, or an MFD in your panel, or on your tablet, uh, or both, uh, you, you'll definitely have those options. So th those are some of the things you'll need to consider. Um, uh, kind of ties, uh, tees up the, uh, the, the questions, the eight questions I suggest that aircraft owners broach with their shops as they contemplate the best ADSB out solution for their aircraft. Unlike the mode C transponder where everybody's was the same. ADSB touches so many things in your panel. Uh, so the first question um, is, uh, do you have a WAS GPS? Um, if you do, it can be your uh, ADSB position source and that increases your options for your ADSB hardware choice. If not, do you have a non-WAS GPS like a Garmin 430, GNS 430, or 530 that can be upgraded? Uh, because if so, upgrading is an option. Um, if you don't have one of those, do you ever want to have a WASP GPS? Um, if you fly in the northeastern United States where we're located, uh, we've lost uh, pretty much all our NDB approaches. The VORR approaches are going away quickly. Uh, they're being replaced by some fantastic, uh, high, highly accurate WASP GPS enabled approaches. So if you fly IFR a lot and you don't have WASP, maybe it's time to uh, go that route. And as Rune said, a lot of shops are reporting that aircraft owners are not just equipping with ADSB. They're upgrading NAV or maybe they're upgrading comms. Some pilots are putting in entirely new panels. Um, you know, that's what everybody wants to do. We can't all afford it. But, uh, if, but, but as you consider ADSB, I really encourage aircraft owners to take a longer view of their needs and their equipage. Um, uh, so, you know, decide if you want to if you want to go WAS, even if you don't do it now. Make the ADSB uh, hardware choice based on where you're going with the WAS. Otherwise, you'll find yourself a few years down the road having to redo your ADSB. Um, uh, the next step is what transponder do you have? Um, uh, we talked earlier about the need to continue to have a functioning uh, mode C or mode S transponder after January 2020. Um, if you have a Bendix King KT97A, great transponder. It's probably 40 years old, 35 years old. Um, on the edge of unsupportable, some shops say they're not supportable now because parts are no longer available. If you have a trans transponder made by Narco, again, it's really at the end of its economic life. So um, uh, if somebody has one of these older transponders, and especially if that transponder has needed work, every year to get through your certification, um, then I strongly encourage owners to look at a transponder solution, replace the transponder with your Mode S solution. That way you don't have to worry about buying Mode S now and then next year your transponder dies, you're having to put a bunch more money in your panel. Um, are you interested in ADSBN, the traffic and weather? If so, do you want to display it uh, on a certified display uh, in your panel? Do you want to display it on a tablet? And if you want to display it on a tablet, uh, Android or um, iOS, you've got to make those decisions and also what app you're going to use. Um, not every ADSB solution is compatible with every screen that might be in your panel. And the same thing with the portables. Not every app and not every tablet style are going to be compatible with every ADSB solution. So you want to make sure if you if you're a if you have a favorite app and you never want to switch, make sure that your hardware solution supports that app. Well, these are these are all good questions, but it goes into um, the big picture of you know equipage considerations. The big picture being, well, how how extensive do you want this to be? Do you want to do a whole panel redo, 
or do you want to just look at it being very tactile, very surgical, and just equipped for the rule? Uh, but here's a list of some other considerations. And here, you know, going from the big picture to very detailed, um, some pilots also want anonymity. They want some privacy, and that can be accomplished um, if you need to change your call sign very frequently, like if you're doing charity operations for angel flight or um, pilots and paws. Um, you might need to look at certain types of equipment that allow you to change your flight ID to that call sign very easily. Um, so there's all kinds of different considerations. Um, we've written, a, Mike's written quite a few different articles about these specific topics to help you through them. Um, and we know um, your shops, such as um, Lancaster Avionics, these types of shops will help walk you through these decisions as well. And I, I do want to call out our friend Todd Adams at Lancaster Avionics. He's done some of these webinars with us in the past. Uh, but the, the, those eight questions from a couple slides ago uh, were based on his list of 10 questions that he goes through with every aircraft owner who's uh, going to him for ADSB. And having uh, taken an AOPA airplane up there for um, ADSB a year or two back, uh, he went through that list of questions for me, with me, even though I told him exactly what we wanted to put in. Fortunately, at the end of that, he agreed with me, so it was, uh, it was a win-win. <laughs> so uh, uh, as I promised, uh, the last thing we're going to cover is uh, case studies. Uh, since it's a very uh, very useful vehicle as far as illustrating the thought process and the, the results in certain cases as far as what pilots selected to install. But I did want to highlight one, one bullet on that previous slide which uh, mentioned the notion that uh, scheduling may become an issue as we move towards 2020. Do you want to elaborate on that just for a moment? Well, I, I can give you a, a, an idea, right? In 2016, before their first rebate, we were doing about 700 to 800 uh, installations a month. Um, over time, we're now close to uh, 1,200 to 1,400 per month. And now with rebate part two, it's increasing. And certainly when we get to 2019, there's going to be increasing demand. Mm -hmm. Um, not only from general aviation, business aviation, helicopters, and a lot of these aircraft owners are also looking at panel upgrades, which take a lot of time and are also more money for the installation shop. And so um, we're seeing backlogs. Um, now is the time, if you need to fly in 2020 into rural airspace, now is the time to start talking to your shops. I mean, we're, we're on the precipice of crossing the less than 400 days to go mark here in the next few weeks. Uh, this is becoming real. This is becoming serious. You know, we've, uh, in our department, talked with shops who have uh, said, uh, oh, we can get you in for your uh, non-ADSB related job, no problem. But we've got so much ADSB related backlog, we can't do your trivial thing for four months. Yeah. I've, I know some shops that are <coughs> currently a six or seven months out. And uh, so, you know, not every shop is, but a lot are. And if you're an aircraft owner that needs to equip for 2020, like Rune said, uh, have that conversation. Um, you know, some shops uh, last year were offering reservations. Basically, you could make a, de a deposit to your shop. They would hold the money. Uh, you would have some shop time scheduled, maybe not till June or July, even if you don't know what you want yet, but you can guarantee that shop time. Um, you know, and, and, and if you have a good relationship with your shop, you know, I would think they would entertain that idea. So if you need to equip, even if you don't know what you want to do, have that conversation with your shop, get on their schedule. If you have to give them a deposit, then give them a deposit. It'll be that much less money you give them at the back end. But, uh, but yeah, it's uh, uh, gonna be a challenge for some. Um, I think the, the more sophisticated the aircraft, uh, the, 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 especially the, the turbine segment, um, it's a lot of some of those aircraft are just now getting options certified, yeah. and they're gonna uh, and, and those tend to take longer than a piston single, for example, to uh, install. So uh, I think it's going to be an even tighter issue for them. But uh, you know, it, it depends on where your shop is, how busy your shop is. But uh, there really are some shops that are are scheduled well into 2019 right now. So yeah, yeah. Caveat emptor. The, exactly. uh, don't don't be surprised to hear about those sorts of uh, lead times. All right, let's uh, let's head into our case study, shall we? Okay. Well, I got a, I got a few for Mike. Um, he's the expert. So we thought we'd start off with a 1960 Bonanza M35, uh, bringing it back into service after a good number of years. Here's a picture of the panel. Uh, the pilot doesn't have WASP GPS, but definitely wants one as a part of a future upgrade to get the better uh, navigation capability. The transponder is an older Narco AT150. Um, and would like ADSBN and would want it on the panel. 
including maybe a docking station for an iPad. Um, and right now the pilot is using an iPad with a ForeFlight, but happy to make a switch uh, based on the equipage solution. What do you think? So, um, and this kind of kind of touches on uh, or, or shows uh, illustrates what I was mentioning earlier. Uh, in this particular case, the aircraft owner definitely wants to upgrade to WAS navigation. So, what I would suggest is decide now what GPS navigator you want to go with. Do you want to go with a Garmin 650 or 750 or one of the new Avidines? Um, you know, those are your 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 strongest contenders in the WAS navigator market right now, and they um, also would com com they would serve as your ADSB out position source. So make that navigation decision. If you go with the Garmin uh, navigators, then the Garmin GTX 345 is really designed to 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 work with those. It'll it'll sing display the traffic and weather right on the navigator display. Um, uh, also to your tablet. If you end up going with the Lynx NGT 9000, I would strongly suggest, I'm sorry, the Avidyne Navigator, I would strongly recommend considering the Lynx NGT 9000 transponder. Uh, Avidyne does offer ADSB solutions, uh, an ADSB out trans, uh, transponder, and then a 978 receiver. So it's two boxes. Um, the installation for that would be a little complicated, uh, but the NGT 9000 works really well with that unit, and you can you'd have a much lower installation cost. And uh, if it's going to display the weather and traffic on the Avidyne display, uh, then you get the NGT 9000's own display as kind of a bonus. So, um, uh, in a case like that, make the navigation decision, pick the ADSB solu solution that goes with that. Um, and even if you don't do the navigation right then, when you do, do, do add the nav a year or two down the road, you'll already have the desired ADSB solution. And that NGT 9000, that's a good looking box. It's, uh, it's one of the more expensive units right. out there. And, you know, and, and let's face it, you know, none of us are made of money. Everybody's looking for the least expensive solution. Uh, but that's not the least expensive, but for a lot of owners, it represents the best value. Yep. It's more expensive, but you, it has a lot crammed into that box and you get a lot of, a lot of bang for the buck. Yep. All right, so what's next? Well, I got one more for you. Um, this is a 1965 Cessna 180. Uh, it spends the summer on floats at a lake in northern Minnesota. Uh, here's a picture of the panel. It has a non-WASP Garmin 430 and an older transponder, a uh, KT76 Alpha. Um, not interested in really going for uh, GPS or WAS uh, navigation because pretty much it's just a VFR aircraft. Um, but would like to get traffic and weather on uh, probably an iPad running uh, for flight. So something simple like that. Okay, so here uh, the solution I would suggest because the owner is not interested in WAS navigation and because the aircraft has a, a, an elderly, shall we say, transponder, um, I would suggest going with either the, uh, the, the uh, Perio Stratus ESG or the Garmin GTX 335 with the built-in position source. So you replace the uh, transponder, install a GPS antenna, connect that antenna to the transponder, and you're done for ADS-B out. Uh, if the owner is already using a portable for ADS-B in, no reason to not continue doing that. Um, if they did want to uh, have ADS-B in, uh, without um, you know uh, a receiver on the glare shield and wires running around the, the cockpit, uh, you could look at doing the the uh, Garmin 345 or the NGT 9000 that has in and out in one <laughs> box and can send it wirely to your tablet, um, and uh, and get that result, uh, albeit at a little higher cost. Right, right, exactly. Um, I think uh, one more aircraft. Uh, this one's a Bonanza F33. Uh, equipped with a Garmin CNX 480 WAS and a King KT76 uh, transponder. Uh, would like out and in, and at the present time is just using uh, four flight on an iPad, um, and is thinking about um, taking out the old King GPS uh, and putting in a, or a King uh, transponder and putting in a Garmin Era 660 in the panel uh, below the existing 480. Uh, so here, it's, uh, the CNX is, is not a, uh, a really well-known box. There just aren't that many of them in the fleet, but it is a WAS uh, navigator, so that could serve as the ADSB out position source. Um, so for, uh, for this installation, the, um, 
uh, Garmin 345 would be a, a great choice. Uh, it would be able to use the position source from the 480. Um, the Aeris 660 has a uh, uh, built-in, or has a display capability. It could be wired to that to display the traffic information. Um, and another bonus of going with the 345 if he decided to upgrade that 480 later to one of the contemporary Garmin navigators, that would be the, the shoe in. Yeah, that'd be uh, a great solution. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, at this time, I think we're going to go to uh, a few questions okay. from the audience. All right, so uh, first I've got a question in no particular Angry order. Birds? Say again? Angry Birds? <laughs> <laughs> Don't watch. <laughs> My score's not that high. <coughs> Peter asks us, uh, uh, I plan to install ADSB in and out. How can I be sure that uh, as new weather products come out, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, I will not have to replace a unit that I may have installed? Sure, yeah. So with FISB, um, uh, an AOPA participates in the FISB group with the FAA and um, many of the, uh, the companies that participate for Flight Garmin, they all participate. Um, Harris is the lead on that because they have the contract with the FAA for FISB um, and all the ground systems. Um, we're all very conscious to any updates we do to FISB. There's always new products, new work underway. AOPA is working with the FAA and Harris right now on some new changes. They'll be very good for general aviation. Um, but what it comes down to is um, software upgrades. Um, and these are usually done very easy, very minimal issues. Um, and it's not hardware. We're not, we're not trying to redesign the system every couple years and, and cost general aviation pilots money. Generally, it's just a very quick upgrade, whether, whether it's a certified system in your panel um, and that's why Garmin participates, make sure it's very easy for the pilot, um, or why for flight, because they just want it to be a very quick uh, update as well. So no, no, no concerns there. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, this is kind of a two-parter, although Mike didn't necessarily intend it that way. It could be. Uh, Mike asks us, uh, in an experimental aircraft, since I have the, uh, the repairman certificate, can I purchase and install an ADS-B outbox and still claim the $500 rebate as well? So two-parter there. So um, uh, that's a great question. Uh, with an experimental aircraft, uh, you know, the, uh, especially with the certificate in hand, uh, he certainly can do any work on his aircraft that it needs. Um, the rebate does require installation of certified equipment. There is some non-TSO'd hardware that's out there available only for the experimental and light sport markets. Uh, those do not qualify for the rebate, but if he bought one, uh, you know, a Garmin or the Lynx or any of the systems we've talked about, which I should have emphasized are certified solutions that can be used in experimentals, but experimental owners do have a little bit more to choose from, um, uh, he would have to go with one of those, but he should qualify for the rebate uh, by installing a certified ADSB out solution. Okay, great. Uh, next, Brad uh, asks us, after my aircraft is compliant with the uh, ADSB out rule, do I need to update my aircraft registration with FAA? Uh, no. So, so once you install ADSB out, um, you're good to go. And unlike the mode C requirement where every 24 calendar months you got to get your system checked, there is no ongoing requirement with ADSB out. Um, what we encourage pilots to do is once you install ADSB out, is um, get what's called the performance monitor report. And this is a report you can pull from the FAA. It's on their website. Just plug in your date of the flight and your call sign, and they'll send you all of the parameters of your flight and make sure your system's working good and no issues. Um, and just hold on to that, keep it for a little while, just as evidence your, your aircraft's working well. And then maybe every annual, just again, get your ADSB uh, performance monitor report because it is free, it's easy to do, and it, it's kind of interesting information. It kind of tells you a little bit more about the system that you know, you're using. One thing though, um, uh, which the, this question made me think about that, the registration, um, if you two years down the road repaint your airplane and change over to a vanity end number, you know, you want your initials in the end number, anything that changes the end number, uh, the end number is one of 20, six or eight, there's quite a few data pieces that ADSB broadcasts in, in every, uh, in every, every uh, one second broadcast. One of those is your end number. So if you, you need to remember that, that that's programmed into your ADSB out hardware. And if you change your end number, 
you need to make sure that you have your avionic shop or if you're it's experimental and, and you can do it yourself you update that to the new end number because uh, if you go flying around uh, with one end number on your airplane and another end number coming out of your ADSB, it's going to eventually be a problem. All right, great. Uh, Mike, you, uh, you set it up as if you're reading my mind. Jim asks, since ADSB typically encodes your aircraft end number, will ATC cease requiring unique squawk codes? No, uh, no. So uh, ATC will continue to issue squawk codes, um, transponder codes, um, and this is just part of the system um, <laughs> that Depending on the air traffic facility, they have different automation capabilities, whether they're using ERAM, STARS, ARTS, micro eARTS. There's a lot of different flavors out there that air traffic control may be able to click your aircraft, see your call sign, your end number, um, whether or not they're talking to you. Some facilities, they may, yeah, they may not be able to see that information. So they, they need to still have that uniquely identifi identifiable squawk code just so they can tell that you are who you say you are and track you safely and efficiently to, to wherever you're going. And if you weren't convinced that uh, Rune is former ATC, I think those acronyms probably just made it made the case. Uh, finally, Christopher uh, makes a comment that might lead to some interesting discussion. Manufacturers requiring their own people uh, to install a particular brand of equipment sounds like a red flag as far as causing a backlog, among other things. So, for example, you know, brand X says only an authorized brand X dealer can install the brand X hardware. Uh, it's not always the case, right? But well, can I be. mean, so there, you know, there are a number of avionics companies, and uh, you know, a lot of them do have policies that uh, their equipment's only available from an authorized dealer. Um, those are business decisions that uh, um, are kind of hard for us to influence, but it's important to be aware of those kind of things. Uh, similarly, if you're looking to install certified hardware in an experimental airplane, you want to do it yourself. Not every manufacturer will let you uh, purchase it as an individual. Some will want you to go through a, uh, an authorized dealer, an authorized repair station. So, um, you know, you can look around. Sometimes you can find some place that will sell you the equipment, even if the manufacturer doesn't really um, encourage that. But, um, but that is one of the things to be aware of as you're going down the equipage road. All right, uh, so let's jump to the second to last slide. We've got a little bit of uh, information there. Uh, explaining AOPA's involvement uh, in, in the ADSB effort. So uh, let's take a look at that. Sure, yeah, and so from a government affairs standpoint, I just want to highlight some of our efforts of improving the benefits case for ADSB equipage for general aviation. And a lot of those benefits um, are different than how the airlines are looking at ADSB. Um, we're seeing it as trying to improve coverage for lower altitudes, more areas, so you don't have to worry about non-radar and rural areas. You can get that vectors to final and flight following more areas. And for us, that means more ground stations. That also will improve ADSB in for traffic awareness as well as for FISB. So you get more NOTAMs, more surface weather observations, and NEXRAD, all that great stuff in more locations across the NAS. Um, we're also working like, work I, working, like I said, on more um, weather products themselves for FISB um, and making great progress on that. Um, and we continue to make announcements. Um, and then um, we're hearing loud and clear from pilots concerns about privacy. So we're making progress on that, working with the FAA, and they're getting towards a demonstration project for 1090 EES systems. Um, but if you go 978 UAT, there is already a privacy solution for that. It's called a anonymous mode. Um, so if you want to, explore that and see if that's a good solution for you if you're looking for privacy. Um, we're also looking at increasing the value of ADSB equipage. One way of doing that is actually um, removing some of the requirements for MOSI transponders. Uh, so with ADSB, it's very reliable, it's digital. We may be able to get away from some of those older 24-month uh, calendar inspections, things like that. Um, and that also goes to lowering the cost of installation, um, working with Canada on their mandate to make it similar to the U.S. So there's nothing crazy or unusual for that country. Um, and then in addressing <coughs> some of the common issues. Those issues can be everything that um, might make you fail uh, a rebate uh, flight or otherwise uh, you know, impact the value of what you've installed. And we're working with the FAA on a lot of those common issues. And um, a lot of that is um, hearing from pilots and hearing the issues they come across. So we always encourage pilots, if you have an issue, just give us a call and let us know, and maybe we can help you with it. Yeah. 
That's a great segue. Uh, calling our Pollen Information Center, that's how we get information from our members into into our staff and my department that then can uh, work with uh, both Mike's team and, uh, and Rune's team to make sure the information gets to the right place and makes things happen. Well, gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we had a good time. We, had, we laughed. We cried. We, uh, <laughs> we talked about the rebate. And uh, hopefully there'll be some, uh, some pilots out there uh, armed with the information on how to take advantage of it now. So Absolutely. thank you very much. Happy to help. Absolutely. All right. And uh, to our viewers, thanks so much for joining us as well. Uh, if you do have any aviation-related questions pertaining to ADSB or any other topics, uh, as part of your membership, you can contact our Pilot Information Center staff Monday through Friday at 800-USA-AOPA, 800-872-2672. There's the phone number on the screen as well as our email address, pilotassist at AOPA.org, Monday through Friday. Uh, we're there available to answer the phones, 8.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And we've also got a link on that slide there. It doesn't just send you to our homepage, but it's a, it's a uh, link that sends you directly into uh, the, uh, the ADSB landing page there on our website, AOPA.org slash ADSB. Also, please subscribe to this YouTube channel using the red subscribe button. Uh, and don't forget to check us out on our website for any other non-ADSB related information as well. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about AOPA, uh, become a member, renew your membership, or explore our products and services, uh, it's all there on AOPA.org. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time.